Okay, welcome back after the break. Uh, before we went for our break, we were uh, just beginning to look at Chapter 5, Kingdom Builders uh, Lifestyle. And uh, we, we saw, or we just kind of discussed, you know, why godly character is important. Okay, so before looking at uh, why godly character is important, let's define what character is. So basically, character is... Uh, Yes, Abu Bakr, do you have a question? You raised up your hand. I have a question. Yes, please go ahead. Yes. Concerning the concerning the assignment, last week assignment. Yes, the I assessment. The assignment. Yes, assessment. I saw it and I did it and I submitted it and I view my score because on that day I wanted to travel to another town and the place I don't know maybe I can see my phone to charge so that is why I quickly did the assignment early in the morning on 14 on 14 of this month so when I, I view my score before I have my daughter I have my daughter but unfortunately I can't charge my phone on the assistance of this month. So when I when I um, charge my phone, I, I hung my daughter. I, I went to my Gmail and I discovered that you score you send my score there. And after that you now send another information about, uh, concerning that assignment. When I go to my class class work and I discovered that the assignment was um, assessment was missing. You wrote missing in front of that assessment and i did it okay so uh if i heard you right you're saying you did the assessments you saw your score uh you yes. also got an email uh regarding your score but now when you go back you're not able to yes. find your assessment right is that what you're saying okay. uh, they say you know, the road missing in front of the, uh, that assessment Okay, so you're saying it's now missing. You don't have to worry. Uh, I haven't actually, uh, uh, you know, sent the scores individually to people. I'll do that. Uh, so you don't have to worry. I'll check if uh, after I, ha I have another hour after this. And after that, I will check uh, if your, you know, your scores are in, your paper is there. And then uh, I will just, uh, you know, reply to you on the stream page. Is that okay? Okay. Okay, yes. okay, thank you. Yes, Jeffina, you have some questions on the assessment? Uh, yes, Pastor. Uh, I think in the last fill in the blanks, when we write it with capital letters, it's actually, I don't know what's the mistake, but I wrote the right answer and it said wrong. So I just hope you know that because I lost math because of it. Yeah, uh, so what I've done is I've uh, uh, last week I've gone through some of the fill in the blanks of those who submitted it, all those who submitted it uh, last, I think last Friday I checked and uh, I have, uh, you know, individually, personally added the grades for those of them who have written the correct answer, if they have written a capital letter or whatever, but if the answer is right, I have given them the grades. So I will do that again uh maybe this Friday or maybe uh, the following Monday, don't worry. Uh, and I will uh, uh, personally go to each one's paper, check everything and then give you the right scores. Oh, if you have you. Right answer. Okay. Thank you, Jafina. Yes, uh, Lubega? Mine was, uh, was uh, that you, 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 you told me that you checked and you saw that I deserved more two marks. Mm -hmm. uh, to add on my my small ones, but uh, when I was checking, I found that it is the same max. It okay. was not changed. Maybe that's what you're going to do on Friday, and we shall see on Monday. It's okay. Yeah, but then I think it's it it changed your scores when I it automatically saves it, so it has to change. Uh, but I'll just check it if it's come uh, uh, on the Google Sheet. It's there, must be in the Google form. But whether it's come on the Google Sheet, I'll check that and then uh, you can. Uh, I'll personally go through and check each of your uh, grades 
and see if it's all right and then uh, I'll then post the right grades to each one of you. Is that okay? Ma'am, even for me. Yeah, I'll do that for everybody. Yeah. Yes. yes. Thank you, ma'am. I'll check Thank everybody's you. paper. Yeah. Okay. Ma'am, there's one blank with the answer is eternal, mm -hmm. eternal kingdom. And mm -hmm. uh, rather, instead of writing just eternal, I wrote in the answer eternal kingdom. So, again, yeah, I'll check, check that. Yeah, mm -hmm. I'll check all of Thank them you, ma'am. Thank yeah. you, ma'am. I've not individually posted your grades to each one of you in the Google Classroom. When I do that, and then you still have uh, any, uh, is there any, any variations or problems? And you can let me know after that, OK? OK, any more questions? OK, we'll uh, look at Chapter 5, OK? So what is character? Character is basically who you are as a person. Uh, it's not what um, others assume you to be or what you uh, assume to be before others. It's basically who you are in secret. Uh, the secret choices that you make actually reveals your character, your actions and reactions uh, in unexpected circumstances reveal your um, character. Your conduct is revealed in your um character and your words, attitudes, decisions are all revealed in your uh, uh, character. So it's basically your value system uh, that influences the choices that you uh, make that ultimately shows forth as your uh, character. OK, just an example uh, of um, uh, the greatest uh, godly character in the Bible. Who do you think, uh, you know, we can say is the greatest godly character in the Bible? Greatest example of a godly character in the Bible? Yes, Rosalind. Mom, Daniel. Daniel, okay, thank you. Yes, Daniel is one of the greatest examples of a godly character. Before Daniel, Thank you, Subhashis. Joseph, yes. Uh, Joseph uh, is the greatest, uh, you know, examples of a godly character very early on in the Bible. Um, we see that, you know, um, when he served in uh, Potiphar's house for 11 years, we know how Potiphar's uh, wife always had an eye on uh, Joseph. If we look at uh, Genesis chapter 39, uh, verse 12, um, it says that, you know, or um, verse 10, it says, you know, she spoke to Joseph day by day that he did not heed her to lie with her or to be with her. Okay, so it was a constant temptation. It was a constant, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, pr proposal that, uh, you know, Potiphar's wife would put forth to Joseph day after day. Uh, but we see that, you know, Joseph never heeded uh, to her proposals, to her, uh, you know, to what she wanted uh, to have him do with her. Uh, we also see that, you know, uh, in the same chapter, Genesis chapter 39, where no one was in the house, even her master, even Potiphar was not there at home, how she uh, takes hold of uh, uh, Joseph's, grabs him, and then he says, you know, uh, how can I do this wicked thing against uh, you, uh, you know, because you're my master's wife, he's not withheld anything from me excepting you because you are his wife. And then he says, you know, how can I sin against God? You know, when I read this uh, uh, many, many years back as a teenager, I was just so amazed to see that even in the situation, you know, uh, Joseph was able to say, how can I sin against God? And I was just asking myself, there's so many times when I have sinned against God, I have done things that are wrong. And I never thought my crossed my mind that, oh, I'm sinning against God. I'm grieving the Holy Spirit that is within me. I'm breaking God's heart. But uh, imagine uh, Joseph in the plight that he was, in the situation that he was, you know, uh, just standing up uh, and saying no which is so difficult and also to in that moment to say you know how can i sin against god so i think 
he's one of the best uh, examples of a godly uh, character. So, you know, uh, we learn from Genesis chapter 39, uh, verses 1 to 12, we learn that, you know, the power to say no to temptation comes from a strong uh, character. Okay, in verse 8, we read that, uh, you know, he refused and said to his master's wife, look, my master does not know what is with me in the house and he has committed all that he has in my hands. So it's just being a good steward, being faithful, being sincere. And so the power to say no comes from a strong character. And we know that, you know, uh, Joseph did have a very strong character, even when his brothers were... Uh, playing the fool, not taking care of the sheep, not doing their work in the fields. He would go and tell his father and his father would basically be very, very angry with them. Uh, and that made, uh, you know, Joseph's brothers more angry than just that quote that his father uh, made for him. And also we, we know that a strong character comes, you know, uh, when we are accountable to God, uh, you know, when no one is watching us so basically i said our character is what we are in the secret in the dark when nobody uh, is seeing us so nobody is uh, uh, knows what we are doing the choices that we are making uh, you know our character is uh, stand strong in our uh, in in the secret place in the quiet when we, there's nobody watching us when we're making our decisions what we are watching what we are thinking um, so our conscience will keep us accountable to god even when no one is uh, watching okay so that is why joseph says how can i sin against potiphar and moreover how can i sin against god and um, you know uh, ability to say no uh, comes from a strong character uh, an ability to say no in the times of temptation is only possible you know when we have a strong uh, character we know that joseph had a strong character because in verse 10 it says the day after day potiphar's wife would go behind uh joseph and uh, he would just deny her or he would not do what she wanted him to do with um, her so you know that uh, a strong character comes when we persistently are saying uh, no to the wrong things or to saying no to temptation a strong character cannot be weakened um and will not uh, give in to continual uh, temptation, okay? So how is character developed? We will look at, um, uh, uh, we'll study the life of uh, Daniel and see how uh, a godly character is uh, developed, okay? We know that uh, Daniel, when he was very young, when he was a teen, uh, he was taken as a captive to, um, uh, to Babylon when Nebuchadnezzar came and destroyed Israel, they took everyone as captive, uh, destroyed the whole of uh, Israel. Uh, and we see that, uh, you know, when uh, Daniel was chosen uh, because he was intelligent, smart, from a princely family, he was chosen to be one of those people who would be trained in Nebuchadnezzar's court so that he can be the future officer in his court. And we see that, you know, uh, Daniel, along with Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego, when they were offered the food from the king's table, uh, knew that they shouldn't be eating that food. And so they... Um, they asked the you know the 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 chief person and he said no you know if i do this and don't diso uh, disobey the king's order then you know it will cost me my life but then they finally spoke to the guard and the guard who was serving them the food and he agreed for 10 days just you know give them uh, lentil soup and vegetables and water and uh, the guard at the end of 10 days saw that, you know, these four boys, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, Daniel, uh, you know, look more healthier, uh, smarter, uh, bright uh, compared to the others who are eating from the king's table. And he allowed them to eat that same food for the next three years. So we see that, you know, uh, uh, a strong character does not come later on in life. It become, begins at a very early stage when in the uh, when the early stages of our life, uh, we are saying no to different things that uh, uh, are not pleasing, that are not right. So it's never too uh, you know, uh, early to start working or developing a godly uh, character. Okay. Uh, also, uh, a strong character comes by the influence of people around us. So if you have people who are also having a good sound character, godly character, strong character, they can be a good influence on our part. Uh, we see that, you know, um, 
uh, Daniel, you know, along with the uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, you know, uh, made the right choices. So he stayed with these three other boys uh, who made the right choices. They also decided not to eat from the king's table compared to the other boys who ate from the king's table. We also see that, uh, you know, uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego refused to bow down before uh, the idol that the king had uh, made. And um, uh, so we see that Daniel, you know, uh, uh, had a had companions who were strong uh, in their moral character. They had strong character. Uh, that's why we see that even when the king said that if you don't tell me the dream that I dreamt and the meaning of the dream, then all of you officers will be killed. And so he goes to his house, Daniel goes to house. He tells uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego what he tells the guard, uh, you know, to just wait for one more day. Uh, he will tell the king what is the dream and uh, the, the interpretation of the dream. And we see that, you know, Daniel, along with these other three uh, men, you know, they pray to God and God reveals the dream that the king had and the uh, interpretation. First Corinthians 15, 33 says, you know, don't be deceived. Evil company corrupts good habits. So we can have good uh, godly habits, but if we have people with the uh, uh, worldly or the wicked, uh, the people from the world, you know, they can influence us and we can easily get influenced by their company. So it's important that, you know, we are along with people who are having strong uh, character, a strong godly character. Okay. Strong moral character is built over time through discipline and practice. Um, we see that in Daniel's life as well. He ate the food, uh, was disciplined in what he was taught about the food habits, the Jewish uh, food habits. And also we see that, you know, when the king uh, made this decree that all of them had to, uh, you know, not worship any other king uh, or, sorry, any other god. Uh, the next 30 years, we see that, you know, Daniel reads the decree he goes to his house, as he usually does, goes to the upper room, opens the door towards Jerusalem, and he kneels down and he prays three times a day, uh, just as it was his custom in his early days. Uh, look at Daniel chapter 6, verse 10. You know, uh, very important. Uh, Daniel chapter 6, verse 10. Can somebody read that, please? Daniel chapter 6, verse 10. Daniel chapter 6, verse 10. But when Daniel learned that the law had been signed, he went home and knelt down as usual in his upstairs room with its windows open towards Jerusalem. He prayed three times a day just as he had always done, giving thanks to his God. Thank you, Jeffina. Just note the words, uh, as usual, uh, just as he has done in his very early days. Uh, you know, the version that we have in our PDF says, you know, uh, as was his customs, since early uh, days so you know character is does not just happen uh, in a second when we face uh, a strong character doesn't happen when we face temptation we're saying no it is built over time through discipline and practice we also know that a strong moral character is strengthened even through adversities even through challenges and difficult situations uh, for example romans chapter 5 verses 3 and 4 which is a very familiar a uh, passage of scripture it says, you know, uh, uh, tribulations uh, produces perseverance and perseverance character and character uh, hope. Okay. So even though we go through difficulties and tribulations and hardships, you know, we need to persevere because our perseverance brings about a strong moral character and character will bring about hope that God is going to deliver us and uh, redeem us and set us up. Uh, free we have that hope okay so we look at why is character important uh, godly character is a very important it's a prerequisite for a kingdom ministry you know the apostle paul when he writes uh 
first and second Timothy to Timothy, uh, even as he's overseeing the churches at Ephesus. And when he writes uh, the book of the epistle of Titus to Titus, who he has left in Crete to oversee the church at Crete, uh, uh, Paul is writing to them and talking about uh, spiritual leaders. And he's saying how to choose uh, spiritual leaders, what are the qualifications he's uh, to look uh, uh, for in that person and note uh, you know uh, in, in in these passages in first Timothy chapter 3 verses 1 to 15 Titus chapter 1 verses 5 to 9 uh, we see that you know Paul is telling them uh, it's not just telling them okay you know choose somebody who is uh, theologically trained who is sound in biblical knowledge who knows uh, bible verses or is able to pray like three four hours a day or uh, you know somebody who is um, uh, attends church regularly i mean uh, he doesn't mention all of that but if you just look at first timothy chapter 3 verses 1 to 15 if you can just turn your bibles or your notes uh, you know, or Titus chapter 1 verses 5 to 9, you'd be surprised to read that Paul says, you know, choose people, you know, who are uh, who are not given to wine, who are not violent, not greedy for money, uh, they're not quarrelsome, not covetous, uh, husband of one my, uh, wife, uh, temperate, sober-minded, you know, not double-tongued, not, uh, not greedy for money, not puffed up with pride, uh, you know, uh, they're not supposed to be uh, having wives who are uh, slanderers, who are uh, unfaithful, uh, you know, who is uh, somebody who is able to take care of their own house. If they're not able to take care of their own wife and their own children, then how can they take care of, um, uh, you know, the house of uh, God? So we see that he, he's talking about how, you know, these bishops, the elders, the deacons, uh, should be uh, what kind of men they should be, you know, not be greedy, not be self will not be quick tempered, not given to wine, not violent. Uh, they should be holy, uh, self controlled, sober minded. I mean, the list is so endless if you look at it, and it's all basically uh, talking about uh, character. Okay, so even what uh, the Holy Spirit is revealing to Paul is hey, you know, if uh, you know character is more important because gifting comes from God and if you don't have the right character you cannot receive the gifting you cannot receive the uh, anointing so true strength of our ministry is not in our anointing uh, but in our uh, character okay uh, Matthew chapter 9 verse 17 says if you put new wine into old skin no, people don't put new wine into old skin because it will break, but they put new wine into, uh, you know, new wine skins uh, so that even uh, when the, the wine is, uh, you know, uh, fermenting, uh, the new wine skins have the capacity to, you know, to uh, enlarge themselves and to accommodate the wine. And hence the wine and the wine skin are uh, preserved. So uh, looking at Matthew chapter 9 verse 17, we can see that, uh, you know, the anointing is the wine and our character is the wine skin. Okay, so if the wine skin, which means if our character is weak, uh, you know, we are not able to, uh, you know, be strong, we are not able to hold on to ourselves, uh, then what happens? You know, the anointing that is there will leak and just be wasted away, okay? So your gifts can take you where your character cannot keep you, you know? Uh, yes, you can have the best gifts, the best talent, you can be the most talented person, but your gift can take you where your character can't uh, keep you so you need to have the strength of character uh, to help you uh, you know to sustain the heights uh, that uh, that God is taking you to the uh, to levels of uh, you know prosperity or promotion that God is taking you uh, you need a strong moral character so that you can retain uh, the gifts the calling and the anointing that God has placed in your life okay your moral character is your true strength a man's uh, or a woman's real strength is their uh, moral character it's your strong moral character that will help you to withstand temptations accusations uh, the persecutions that you go through the lies of the enemy the, and other pressures that you um, 
face okay uh, and the most important message you know we can preach the most uh, beautiful message uh, with the most beautiful words with the you know the best theology and all of that but if our life does not speak you know, uh, if our character does not speak, then nobody will be interested in listening uh, to us. So it's important that, you know, uh, when our character is good, you know, that even if it's a simple message, even if it's very down to earth, even if it does not have any charisma or, you know, any kind of style, uh, you know, people will listen and the anointing will flow through powerfully and God will minister because it's not the charisma, it's not the words, it's not the style, uh, but it's what God is interested in, is in our character. And, uh, you know, when we have a good a godly character the anointing will flow through uh, very very powerfully and the uh, the gifts that god has given to us will be used to minister to uh, people and we see uh, this in the life of paul himself you know paul himself says imitate me as i imitate christ just imagine him saying that imitate me as i imitate christ you know he could have said imitate christ but he's saying imitate me my uh, to say that statement or to make that statement, that bold statement requires, you know, years of strong character and no one able to point an accusing finger and say, hey, how can you say that when you did this yourself? But Paul is able to stand up and say, you know, uh, imitate me as I imitate um, Christ. And we see him writing in, uh, in um, you know, First Thessalonians chapter uh, one verses five and six he says you know uh, the gospel that i preach does not come only with word but also in power uh, and he says that you know you know what kind of men we were among you for your sake so he says my gospel that i preach not only comes with word but also demonstration of god's power but also you know what kind of people we are what kind of men we are how we live our uh, lives if you look at uh, first thessalonians chapter 2 verses uh, 1 to 10 uh, you know in verses 3 4 5 6 uh, paul says you know uh, you know that the exhortation that he brings about does not come from error or uncleanness uh, there was there is no deceit in him but he says you know we are being approved by god uh, because god has entrusted the gospel to us so even as we speak uh, we know we don't uh, speak to please men we are not men pleasers uh, but we do it to please god because he's the one who tests our heart and every time we come and speak to you we don't speak with flattering words um, as you know, nor our cloak for covetousness, uh, God is our witness. That means we don't depend on you. We don't, uh, you know, benefit from you. We don't take from what is yours. Um, Paul was a tent maker. He had this business. He worked himself, supported himself. Um, so we see that, you know, he does not make demands from anybody. He does not make use of uh, the people. And uh, in uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 10, he says, You are our witness and God also, how devoutly and justly and blamelessly we have behaved ourselves among you who believe. So just imagine those words. He says, you know, uh, you are our witnesses you know he's just calling upon them he says you are our witness you know how devout we have been how just we have been how blameless uh, we have behaved ourselves so i think you know uh more than busying ourselves into just building God's kingdom, uh, we need to concentrate on our, uh, you know, building our character, godly character, so that we can be like Paul saying, you know, uh, uh, we uh, imitate me, you know, or, you know, look at how devout, just, blameless I have been, so that no one can point an accusing uh, finger at us. So our life speaks the greatest message we will ever preach. Uh, is the life that we live because people can forget all about our messages what we have said but uh, it's our life that uh, speak volumes that uh, you know speaks uh, a great uh, deal okay um, dr edwin says a man is more than a message your message is credible because you are credible when a man is no longer credible his message is uh, suspect okay now we look at spiritual maturity uh, as important as spiritual gifting. So, you know, we are all interested in gifting. We want the gifts of the spirit. We desire the gifts of the spirit. We run behind that. Uh, but it's uh, spiritual gifting 
uh, is important, but more important than that, or as important as that, is spiritual um, maturity. Okay, so what is uh, spiritual maturity, uh, and how do we assess if we are truly spiritually uh, mature? Now, in the New Testament, uh, there are three words that are used for spiritual maturity. Uh, and, uh, you know, when translated in English, it's basically uh, just a basic word called complete. But then if you look at or examine the three Greek words used for spiritual maturity, it just speaks more than complete. It gives us, uh, you know, uh, additional insights. So there are three words, Greek words. One is tilios, the other one is plero, the other one is katarits. Okay, so katarits. Uh, tilios, pilirio, and katarits. So what is tilios? Tilios is uh, basically meaning complete, uh, coming to full age, being mature, a perfect man. Uh, it basically means somebody is full of age or just grown up and adult, uh, and it's used in a, in a context of maturity. Uh, so a person is of uh, full age or com uh, perfect or complete. Uh, uh, it refers to their mental and their moral character. The word pilero is, uh, means to fill up. Okay, we look at various uh, references in the Bible where these words, Greek words are used so that we can understand better. Uh, pilero is basically meaning uh, to fill up. It can also be translated complete, but uh, the literal meaning is to fill up. And the, the third Greek word which is used for spiritual maturity in the New Testament is katharids, um, which means to be complete thoroughly, uh, thorough equipping. Uh, so it's often translated as complete, but the literal meaning is to be thoroughly equipped. Okay, so let's look at uh, various uh, uh, verses in the New Testament where we can identify uh, these, where we can see these words and we can identify seven characteristics of spiritual maturity using uh, these Greek words. The first one is that spiritual maturity is growing in Christ likeness. Uh, so can somebody please open up to Matthew chapter 5 verse 48, somebody else can open to Ephesians chapter 4 verse 13, and somebody else can open up to Colossians chapter 1 verse 28 and 29. So one person can please read Colossians 1, 28 and 29, another person can read Ephesians 4, 13, and another person can read Matthew chapter 5 verse 48. So who will read Matthew chapter 5, verse 48? Matthew chapter 5, verses, verse 48. Therefore, you shall be perfect, but just as your Father in heaven is perfect. Thank you. So here the word perfect is uh, teleos, which is meaning, you know, uh, coming to full age or mature, a perfect man. So basically it's therefore you shall be a mature man, complete full of age, just as your father in heaven is uh, perfect. Okay, so Jesus is challenging us uh, to be full grown people, mature people, uh, adults, full of age. And that is how God wants us to be. He does not want us to be childish. Okay, Ephesians chapter 4 verse 13. Uh, Ephesians. Ephesians. Yes, go ahead. Go ahead, Lubega. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 13. It says, Till we all come to the unity of the, of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you. So here the word perfect is teleos. So, you know, it's basically talking about, you know, being a spiritually perfect man, spiritually mature man. Uh, so when do we become a spiritually perfect uh, man or a mature man or woman? It means when we come to the full stature of the fullness of Christ, which means that spiritual maturity is growing into 
uh, Christ likeness. And uh, in verse 15 of Ephesians chapter 4, it says, you know, we are called to grow up into all things into uh, Christ likeness. So in every area of our lives, we must be aligned, uh, just aligned to who Christ is, just to be who uh, he is, to be like he is. And Christ must be manifested in all areas of our uh, life. And this is what God wants to accomplish in each one of our lives, even as we journey through life, even as we become kingdom builders. We know that the minute we, uh, you know, we uh, confess our sins and ask Jesus to be the Lord and Savior of our lives, we know the Holy Spirit comes and lives in us and he sanctifies us. He makes us more Christ-like. Okay, Colossians chapter 1 verses 28 and 29. Can somebody read that, please? Can I read, ma'am? Sure, please. Thank you. Colossians chapter 1, verses 28 and 29. Him we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom, that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. To this end, I also labor, striving according to his working, which works in me mightily. Thank you. Amen. Rosalind, amen. Uh, so the word uh, perfect here is again the Greek word teleos. So, you know, the goal of Christian ministry, what is the goal of Christian ministry is to present each person, you know, mature, full of age, uh, you know, uh, 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 being strong and mature uh, in Christ. Okay. So that's the first area of spiritual maturity. We're going to look at uh, uh, six more you know, we're going to look at uh, totally about um, uh, seven ways uh, we can identify the characteristics of spiritual maturity in the New Testament. The first one, spiritual maturity is growing into Christ uh, likeness. The second one is spiritual maturity is being perfect and complete in all the will of uh, God. So can somebody please read Colossians chapter 4 was 12 and somebody else can open up to second corinthians chapter 13 verses 9 and 11 and one more person to hebrews chapter 13 was 20 and 21 uh yet another person to luke 6 40 and another person to ephesians 4 11 to 12. so it is ephesians 4 11 and 12 luke chapter 6 was 40 Another person, please, can read Hebrews 13, 20, and 21. And someone else can read 2 Corinthians 13, 9, and 11. The second point, spiritual maturity is being thoroughly equipped for every good work. So can one of you please read 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 9 and 11, please? Second Corinthians chapter 13, verse 9 and 11. For we are glad when we are weak and you are strong. And this also we pray that you may be made complete. Finally, brethren, farewell, become complete. Be of good comfort, be of one mind, live in peace, and the God of love and peace will be with you. Amen. Thank you, Zelatoli. So here yeah, the words uh, complete in this verse is, is the Greek word so and it's basically saying that you know we need to pray for believers what do we pray for believers you know we pray that they become fully equipped uh you know and also uh another injunction here is to become complete or fully equipped uh and so this uh, the responsibility here uh, in this verse is on us that you know we need to do what it takes uh, to be fully equipped, to equip ourselves uh, to journey towards spiritual maturity. So spiritual maturity does not come automatically. You know, spiritually, uh, spiritual maturity is our responsibility. Uh, we need to take the steps that is required to equip ourselves to be fully equipped uh, 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 as we journey towards spiritual maturity. Hebrews 13, 20 and 21. Hebrews chapter 12, 13, verse 20 and 21. Who brought up our Lord Jesus from the dead? 
through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you complete in every good work to do his will, working in you what is well pleasing in his eye, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Thank you. Amen. So in Hebrews chapter 13, here again we see this uh, uh, the prayer is for God, you know, to work in the believer, to fully equip them so the words are complete. Uh, in verse 21 is katharizo. So, you know, we need to pray uh, and ask God to, you know, to work in the believer, to bring them into full equipping, to carry out every good work according to His will. Uh, and, you know, this equipping uh, that ha happens as God works in our lives, enabling us uh, to do what is well pleasing in His sight, as we just read in this, uh, just as we just read in this verse. So we cannot receive equipping to work out every good work. Okay. Uh, it's Christ who works in us. Uh, so apart from His work in us, uh, bringing about what is well pleasing in His sight. Okay. So we cannot receive equipping to work out every good work. We just pray, but it, uh, the equipping happens as God works in us uh, and enabling us to do what is well-pleasing in His sight. Luke chapter 6, verse 14. Luke chapter 6, verse 14. May I, ma'am? Yes, please. Thank you. Luke 6, 40. A disciple is not above his teacher, but everyone who is perfectly trained will be like his teacher. Amen. Amen. Thank you. This, the word perfectly trained is katharizo, the Greek word. So Jesus desires that all of us, his disciples, be like him. You know, uh, for us to be like our teacher, you know, we need to go through the process of being thoroughly trained and uh, equipped. The last verse in the second point is Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 and 12. Can somebody read that, please? Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11 and 12. Now, these are the gifts Christ gave to the church the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and teachers. Their responsibility is to equip God's people to do His work and build up the church, the body of Christ. Thank you. So here the Greek word uh, is for equipping is katharizo, or, uh, and it's it's basically talking about the fivefold ministry that, uh, you know, that the Holy Spirit gives to uh, various people. And he says that, you know, this fivefold ministry is for the equipping of the uh, saints. Okay. So again, the word katharizo here is uh, basically talking about, you know, thoroughly being equipped, uh, you know, uh, being complete uh, so that we can uh, equip the saints for the work of the ministry. The third uh, aspect of spiritual maturity is, uh, you know, when we are spiritually mature, uh, it gives us the ability to receive uh, solid meat, which means gives us the ability to receive a revelation. Okay. In Hebrews chapter 5, verse uh, 11 to 14, um, you know, uh, the writer is saying, of, of whom we have much to say and hard to explain since you have becoming become dull of hearing, for though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God, and you have come to need milk and not solid food. For everyone who partakes only of milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But solid food belongs to those who are full age, teleos, the Greek word that's used here. That is, those who by reason of use have, be, have their senses exercised to discern both good and uh, evil. So here basically uh, in, this, in this verse and in Hebrews chapter 6 verses 1 to 3 and 1 Corinthians chapter 2 verses 6 to 7, he says, you know, um, uh, he's talking about, you know, only when we are spiritually mature, when we come to full age, you know, can we receive 
uh, the, uh, the doctrines, the teachings of God's word. We can receive the solid meat. Solid meat means a revelation, the truth of God's uh, word. And so here the, in, in, the, in, the, in the verses that I just read, you know, the writer is saying you need to be teachers, but you are, you know, still, uh, you know, not in that position to teach because you are, uh, you know, just needing milk. Okay, and he says you're just still babes, and he says solid food belongs to those who are fu are full of age. That means uh, mature, fully grown adults, uh, and by the reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. So it's basically a spiritual mature person is a person who has a renewed mind, and a renewed mind is able to understand the ways and the thoughts uh, of God. A renewed mind is able to, you know, through their senses, able to discern what is good and evil, what is wrong, right and wrong, and able to do what is right and not do what is um, wrong. So he's saying, you know, uh, in these in these passages of scripture, saying these people who have you know, actually gone through the basics. They have learned the elementary principles uh, and are pressing forward towards uh, maturity. Uh, you know, only when they do that, they come become of full of uh, age. But these are people who are able to receive and these kind of people who come to full age are mature in their understanding, in their spiritual maturity. They're full, full of age. They're mature. He says, are able to receive wisdom and understand the mysteries of the kingdom of God. The third thing is spiritual maturity is having our senses trained uh, to discern what is right and uh, wrong. So our senses is basically our soul, our mind, will, and our emotions you know when our mind will and emotions we know uh, our uh, when we are born again our spirit man is born again but our body and our soul is just the same and so we need to you know be renewed by the transforming of our minds uh, you know where we are basically feeding our, our soul uh, with the word of god and when we are feeding our mind with the word of God, you know, then we are able to constantly, uh, you know, uh, we have a renewed mind, we are able to understand the ways of God, the mind of God. Uh, and we are, you know, we have our senses trained in knowing what is right and wrong. The next one, the fourth one is spiritual maturity is putting away uh, childish uh, behavior. Now we know that when we ask, when we, a person is an adult, we see him mature, you know, doesn't behave like a kid. There are some adults who are not mature. They, we see them behave, behaving in very childish ways. We see some young people who are very mature in their ways of behaving and understanding. They don't behave like uh, uh, children. And also their understanding, their thinking, their speaking is not childlike, but very uh, mature. And so spiritual maturity puts us in a place where our understanding, thinking, and our speaking is spiritually mature according to the ways and the thoughts of um, God. And if we need to understand God, if we need to know what God is speaking to us, if we need deeper revelations uh, that God wants, you want God to reveal to you, you want to know deeper truths, then you need to journey towards spiritual uh, maturity, which means you cannot, uh, a childish person is a carnal person. If you're feeding your spirit uh, your spirit that means you're growing to spiritual maturity but if you're behaving very carnal you're feeding your carnal nature your your uh, fleshly nature that means you're becoming very childish and how do you know if you're being very childish if you have envy jealousy there's you know you uh, uh, you you don't live in unity you're constantly bringing strife uh, you are competing with others there's selfish ambition all of these are characteristics of a childish behavior. And you know that you are childish uh, and you need to journey towards spiritual maturity. And uh, people with a childish behavior cannot understand the ways and the thoughts of uh, God. The next one is spiritual maturity is having your whole body and tongue in uh, control. Okay. James chapter 3 verse 2 says, For we all stumble in many things. If anyone does not stumble in words, he's a perfect man. That means uh, telios, fully mature, um, 
you know, a perfect man, full of age, okay? Uh, and he's able also to bridle the whole body. So a spiritually mature person has the ability to keep their body uh, in control, means how much uh, they sleep, what they eat, exercise, what they indulge in. They're able to, uh, you know, keep a control over their body and their uh, tongue. We know that self-control is not the result or the work of the carnal nature is the work of the spirit in our lives and also it's a sign of spiritual maturity so if you want to know if you're spiritually mature you know you need to see how you're you know uh controlling your uh bodily appetites you know i'm not just talking about uh what you're eating your sexual appetites your uh the desires of your flesh what you're buying how you're spending your mon money what you're indulging in and also you know uh controlling uh the tongue uh, the book of proverbs teaches us about the importance of self-control it says in proverbs chapter 16 verse 32 he who is slow to anger is better than the mighty, and he who rules his spirit than he who takes the uh, takes a city. Proverbs chapter twenty five verse twenty eight says, "A person without self control is like a house with its doors and windows knocked out." Okay, so we know that spiritual maturity is a process; it does not happen instantly. It takes time. Uh, hence, we journey with God. And how do we journey with God? We don't feed our carnal nature. We feed our spiritual uh, spiritual nature. How do we do that? Not uh, reading his word, the more his word. Uh, we're meditating on his word. It renews our mind. It fills our soul uh, and our body. And, uh, you know, and also through other people and through other life experiences, we can learn. And hence, we constantly progress in spiritual maturity. Okay, we'll continue with uh, this chapter uh, five in the next class. Anyone has any questions before we sign out? Any questions? Okay, no questions. Okay, if there are no questions, we'll end class. Thank you, everyone, for joining class. Have a Good week, uh, week ahead and God bless. I will see you next Wednesday. Thank you.